Welcome everyone to today's webinar, How Specialty Pharmacy Plays a Role in Creating Sustainable Health System Health Plan Collaboration, sponsored by Trellis Rx. I'm Mackenzie Bean with Becker's Hospital Review. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your screen. We look forward to hearing your questions. Today's session is being recorded and will be available after the event. You can use the same link used to log into today's webinar to access the recording. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's presenters. Andy Pulvermacher is a principal consultant at Bluefin Group, a healthcare management and technology consulting firm. He has hands-on experience in specialty pharmacy, supply chain, and patient service development having created the Specialty Pharmacy Program at UW Health. Andy has served in an authorship role for the development of specialty pharmacy accreditation standards and is a member of several national committees tasked with assisting IDNs with the development of specialty pharmacy strategies. Jerry Buller is the Chief Pharmacy Officer at Trellis Rx a specialty pharmacy services provider that works hand-in-hand -hand with health systems to enhance patients' medication therapy experience. Prior to joining Trellis, Jerry served as the Director of Specialty Pharmacy at Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville, where their unique clinic-based model serviced 23 specialty clinics, including those for organ and stem cell transplants. For over nine years, Jerry worked at Georgia Cancer Specialists in Atlanta, where he more recently served as the Director of Pharmacy and Business Services and previously held the position of Lead Research Pharmacist. At this time, I am pleased to turn the floor over to Jerry to begin the presentation. Thank you, Mackenzie, uh, and thank you everyone for joining today. And before we dive into our agenda and objectives, I wanted to share a couple poll questions with our audience give them a chance to respond and I think it may help us better understand who's with us today and to learn more about the relative importance of specialty medications to each of your organizations. So the first question is uh, what types of organizations do you represent? So if you could take some time maybe 20 seconds to respond and check the box that most appropriately fits you we would appreciate it. Okay, I think um I don't know the two or three seconds. Okay, thank you. And the result here, uh it's no surprise that a majority of our, our guests on the call today are health systems. However, we do have a nice uh, mix of folks from health plans or PBMs, as well as the manufacturers as you can see, and other stakeholders, and those stakeholders may comprise of consultants or or other folks interested in this topic. We have one more poll question. And that question is, how important is the management of specialty medications to your organization or to your customers? If you could select one of those, that would be great. Okay, thank you. And uh, let's see what those results, uh, survey results look like. And it's no surprise, the uh, management of specialty medications to organizational customers is a top priority. Uh, there was some, not so much of a priority, but uh, either it's a medium or top priority, which, which really frames this discussion up well. And I can see by the answers to the questions that there are high priority, majority of our audience, they consider this really important and it enforces why we chose to conduct the research we'll be highlighting today. And I'd like to start by thanking everyone attending today for your time and frankly the privilege of being able to allow both Andy and I to spend the next 45 minutes or so sharing details from research that was conducted earlier this spring. And going back to why we did or conducted this research, our desire at Trellis is to advance the practice of specialty pharmacy. And in my 20 years in the specialty pharmacy space and over the past 10 years in the health system space specifically, I don't believe there's been one single subject that seems to come up more often in my conversations with specialty pharmacy leaders than that of payer contracting and more specifically payer lockouts. 
And I do know that some health systems have had success in contracting with payers. And I've been fortunate to participate in a number of successful contract executions with health plans. So it is possible. Now, when I think of something like limited distribution or LDD lockouts, manufacturers have been, for the most part, pretty communicative about their needs, their requirements, partnership desires, et cetera. Payers, not so much. And it lets me ask the question, now, what are they thinking? You know, what do they want? And better yet, you know, if they really knew what we were doing at my institution, surely they'd want to partner with us. So my goal today, and both Andy and I's goal, is to be able to communicate the findings gleaned from nearly 30 hours of research interviews and responses and then provide everyone in attendance here, regardless of your position as a stakeholder, with at least two to three actionable items that you can walk away with to further partnership discussions in the realm of health systems, specialty pharmacy, and health plans. And if we look at the agenda, we'll start by setting the stage. We're going to ask Andy to contribute some high-level insight into to, to the industry and, and how we got here. And then we'll review the research questions and design, and then we'll dive into the research findings, you know, the meat of this, what do we find? And then finally, some strategies for building partnerships, taking the research, and then are there strategies that we can develop to do this. So before we dive into the detail of our findings, I'd like to ask Andy Pulvermacher with the Bluefin Group to provide some background and context around the health system space, specialty pharmacy space, and sort of set the stage, if you will. Andy? Yeah, thanks, Jerry. So I think if we go to the first slide, I think the key here is, Jerry had mentioned, both of us come from a long history of working within the health system space. And I think what we need to recognize is these challenges are not new. So back as early as 2008, when the health systems were really starting to focus on building their own specialty pharmacy programs, the two key issues identified at that time were manufacturer product access and payer lockouts, which were facing their patients. So what we're finding is not a lot has really changed in 12 years. We continue to focus and identify the same challenges. And if we take that and if we benchmark off of what's happened within healthcare premiums over the past 10 years, what we're seeing is there's been around a 50% increase in annual premiums for healthcare at the same time that we've seen about a 1.6% increase in employee benefits and employee salaries. So there's no surprise there that we're seeing this disproportionate and really unsustainable growth in healthcare premiums and healthcare expenditures related to high cost care, which are disproportionate to the income of employees and beneficiaries. And what we need to do is we need to take a step back and we need to think and reflect as an industry and decide, are we truly interested in trying to bend the cost curve? And should we be reimagining that legacy specialty care model? Should we be thinking about something different, something unique, something which can provide a differentiator to a challenging marketplace? So if we go to the next slide, I think the, the next key is we need to have a meaningful dialogue about what specialty is and what the dispensing model truly is. So if we take a step back and we think about retail, retail at its core is really a dispensing operation, the way to get medication in the hands of patients. And all service models start with that core dispensing operation. As retail started to diversify and get into mail order, what happened was we built a layer of logistics on top of the traditional retail dispensing backbone. When we think about specialty pharmacy, the key here is you can't walk up and touch a specialty pharmacy. What you're doing is you're touching a retail pharmacy which has a service model put on top of it. It was the patient care services that were differentiating to specialty. So we've already identified that there are different levels of service which characterize the different levels of care that are being provided from the pharmacy perspective. And what we need to do is we need to identify where are we moving to and how do we improve care. And it's really through a clinical integration and management um, type of offering. So if we transition to the next slide, what we need to do is we really need to identify what's different about a clinically integrated model. And we need to take a different mindset. It can't be a field of dreams mindset. So health systems historically have built these programs. They've tried to message to them. And they've had frustrations about the fact that the payers didn't necessarily come asking to participate. And it was a challenge to try to find ways to collaborate because of challenges in messaging how the model is different. So what we need to do is we need to stop running from the market differentiators and truly embrace them. And we need to identify where 
is the differentiation? Where is the integration? And how does it improve the patient journey? I think collectively health systems need to identify that they truly have a different model. It's not a specialty model. The specialty model doesn't cleanly define it, and we need to start calling it something unique, different, to reflect those differentiators that make it unique and a better option for patients. The next key is the audio has got to match the video. So we speak about value, we speak about differentiation, we speak about improved outcomes, but you can't speak to those things unless you can truly deliver results. So we need to speak to the value, we need to be cognizant of measuring it, and we need to deliver the results. And the last piece is we really need to identify what are the root causes of patient access challenges within the market. We need to focus on things we've known about for a long time. We need to manage polypharmacy and manage the patient holistically. It's one patient journey, not a patient's diagnosis which drives the journey, it's the individual patient. We need to focus on intervening earlier, we need to manage the commercial product journey, and we need to make sure that we're focused on um, optimizing the patient journey and managing the cost along the way, rather than waiting until a patient is already on high cost therapy. So in the next slide are really my key takeaways. So from a marketplace standpoint and marketplace view, we need to transition our mindset from sick care to well care. We need to focus less on episodic treatment and more on prevention. And we need to manage the patient earlier in the clinical journey when they're on five ASAs for Crohn's disease instead of on an injectable biologic. We need to manage the patients earlier in their clinical course to demonstrate value and really bend the cost curve. We need to speak to the integration. So many of the programs stand up separate silos of support. There's pharmacists within the clinic. There are pharmacists within the inpatient units. There are pharmacists within the specialty pharmacy. But those pieces need to be tied together and we need to make sure we're focusing on the patients who need us the most. The next is really that we need to understand that speaking is not communicating. So your message doesn't get heard just because you say it. We need to stop messaging about having a better mousetrap or a better model or a better solution and truly start measuring it and reporting it. That's where the differentiation comes in. But I think the key thing for me really from this research report and from previous experiences, you need to go into this with realistic expectations. You can't hope for a solution and hope is not a strategy. You need to have a very customized approach to building value for an individual payer. It can't be one size fits all. So you need to understand what their needs are. You need to understand how you fit those needs and ultimately how you solve the challenges the patients face. With that, I'll transition it back to Jerry. Thank you, Andy. Uh, that's a great summary. And I like your slide where you refer to making the audio and the video match, sort of speak to the value and measure the value and really deliver results. Um, and, and as we'll see in this research, if health systems are to make progress on the payer front, they'll need to create and demonstrate value like you just spoke of, Andy. So as we, next slide. Um, so as we embarked on this project, we wanted the research to be impactful and truly help move the conversation forward. We wanted this to be more of a qualitative versus a quantitative report. So like any research project, we needed to ask ourselves, what do we want to know? And in short, what are we trying to answer? And this pointed us to two key questions. One, why do health systems struggle to build collaborative specialty pharmacy partnerships with health plans? And two, what opportunities can health systems leverage to build mutually beneficial specialty pharmacy partnerships with health plans? As we set out to answer these two questions, we engaged in conversations with colleagues in the practice of health system specialty pharmacy for insight. And we even searched the market for information and publications that could shed light on this subject and frankly found it to be lacking. Simply wasn't a lot of information on the dynamic between health plans and health system specialty pharmacies. Well, on some level, we do consider this research to be you know, the first of its kind. And the medium used to gather the data for our research was through individual surveys, 
Now, we engaged a third-party market research firm to conduct 20 blinded interviews of leaders of health plans as well as health system specialty pharmacies. And by utilizing hour-long blinded interviews, we hope to solicit candid or unfiltered feedback from our respondents. And we wanted honesty, right? And in addition, we conducted eight unblinded interviews with various stakeholders in the health system specialty pharmacy space. And this group included consultants as well as health system managed care leads and pharmacy leaders. So now that we've reviewed the methodology, let's take a look at some of the key takeaways from this research. Now, as we enter this segment of the presentation where we dive into the research findings, I wanted to share a quote from this survey that really stood out to me, and this was from a health system pharmacy director. He said, I've sat at meetings with different insurers, and I'm always mortified because I don't understand their picture of the world and I don't understand what's important to them. You know, many times I'm surprised because they don't understand what we're doing on our side of the world either. We don't talk. Usually the patient is the ping pong ball and all of this. And I felt like this quote provides a backdrop into what we saw in the overall responses from most survey participants. Thus the headline in this slide, misperceptions and silos inhibit collaboration today but leaders agree partnership is needed to improve value of specialty pharmacy for all. I feel like this rings true. So we'll break this research findings into three buckets. That of the health system, or the, excuse me, the health plan perspective. And then two, the second bucket is the health system perspective. And then finally, the common ground that exists between the two. So let's take a look in the first bucket, and that bucket is that of the health plan perspective. So of the 10 health plan leaders that were surveyed, the respondents universally spoke to cost as a priority or the theme. The problem of rising drug costs is what they said keeps them awake at night. And so to understand the plan perspective or the health plan perspective, we must first see the things from their point of view and what challenges they are faced with, you know. And there's some background, and Andy alluded to this earlier in, in some of his slides, that since 2009, the average family premiums have increased 64%, and the workers' contribution of that has increased 71%, several times more quickly than wages and inflation at 26 and 20% respectively. And also, payers face challenges because it's difficult to understand the cost of care benefits of specialty drugs when the medical and pharmacy benefits, for the most part, remain siloed. And oh, yes, orphan drugs account for around 40% of the drugs across the disease category in the 2020 pipeline. So health plans see a tidal wave approaching. And after hearing our health plan respondents, I believe a lot can be gained by viewing payers simply as businesses trying to provide value to their customers. And this quote from a health plan executive really stood out to me. He said, costs going up, ticks off people that are trying to renew clients. It's driven by specialty. Year over year, I'm paying 20% more for specialty drugs. Employers don't want to pay. And the respondents from health plan participants on how they are addressing these challenges were pretty consistent. They are employing strategies such as vertical integration, side of care mandates, formulary management, and also more and more hiring pharmacists to conduct medication therapy management. So the research highlighted the challenges health plans are facing. And as we heard, the, the concern was cost. But what about the health plan's perceptions of health system specialty pharmacy? In other words, when they think of health system specialty pharmacy, their capabilities, their value, and their role in the patient journey, what's their understanding? Well, the blinded research here revealed another near universal truth, or not truth, but a view that health system specialty pharmacies are expensive providers of a commodity service. Now, when asked these questions specifically designed to uncover their perceptions and understanding, the response, responses revealed that they view specialty pharmacy services predominantly through the lens of dispensing. 
And we can refer back to that first circle in Andy's first slide of that just dispensing piece. But we know that's just the beginning. Health plan leaders also stated in the surveys that they believe health system specialty pharmacies are more expensive than alternatives. And some of these answers seem to point to their experience with the costs of providing infusion in the hospital outpatient setting. Another consistent response is that they don't think health system specialty pharmacies can match scale or services of other specialty pharmacies. And they pointed to their own PBM specialty pharmacy with a massive footprint and have a tendency or had a tendency to compare that to a regional health system or a smaller a health system with a specialty pharmacy. And yes, even some admitted their organizations, frankly, are in competition with health system specialty pharmacies. And in addition, there was a misperception that the individual health systems want to service patients nationally. And what I found very interesting was the majority of survey respondents, not all, but a majority revealed a, just a general lack of awareness of capabilities and goals and some even the existence of health system specialty pharmacies. And as someone who has been in the health system specialty pharmacy space for over a decade, I thought, man, we really missed the mark here. So that being said, I'd like to invite Andy uh, back in to weigh on, in on his, this, you know, the health system perspective, the health plan perspective from his perspective. Andy, do you mind kind of weighing in on this? Yeah, thanks, Jerry. I think my key takeaways were the same as yours, that when we look at the communication and, and the perception that we've been communicating this whole time about the value and, and why to include health system-based specialty pharmacies in networks, it's clear that that has not resonated with our intended audience. So I think there's a key here that there's been a lot of talking, not necessarily that mutual identification of opportunities, and it hasn't been clean on the communication side. So I think it comes back to what we talked about many times within the health systems, again, as far back as 2008, that we really need to define how the model is different and make sure that there's good awareness in the marketplace about how it's different so that we're not continuing to be compared to existing models. It needs to be that differentiated approach to care that resonates with the payer and provides value to the patient. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you, Andy. I appreciate that insight. So, we've reviewed the key takeaways from the interviews conducted with health plan leaders. <clears throat> now, let's look at what we found after interviewing health system pharmacy leaders. As a backdrop to this perspective, now this spring has seen nearly every health system financial situation worsen by COVID-19 been a challenge in 2020 to say the least and strategic initiatives like specialty pharmacy are being brought front and center. So as we move to discuss the health system's point of view, let's first take a look at this quote from the research and it's from a health system director who stated, if the health plan's pharmacy does a crummy job taking care of the patient, we get the readmission, we pay a lot of money, the insurance company makes a lot of money on it and the patient does poorly. And as you can see from the headline here, health systems see specialty pharmacy as a strategic opportunity to address key challenges, but still face barriers to success. Now, our survey respondents of health system leaders pointed to an increasing economic pressure they face. Uh, excuse me. Increased um, pressure the health systems face from the squeeze of decreasing reimbursements, whether from the managed care side or reduction in outpatient infusion fees. And also health system leaders talked about the market shifts from fee-for-service to more risk-based or ACO-type models. Health systems are realizing they need more control. And in the words of one health system leader, if I'm at risk, why would I want to outsource the pharmacy care? And still, as it was confirmed by the 10 pharmacy leaders' question, accreditation access to limited distribution drugs and payer contracts still remain huge challenges. And the health system leaders in our research firm uh, surveys conducted, they told us that securing capital investments, FTE approvals, and overall buy-in from leadership is still a huge challenge, even despite already having a specialty pharmacy in place. 
And finally, this goes back to what you highlighted in the beginning, Andy, that the research revealed a concern of lack of benchmarking standards and outcome studies proving value of health system specialty pharmacy. Our respondents, all of them, felt this must be addressed, and it makes it difficult, frankly, to define good and also dilutes the value proposition, which we'll talk about later when considering partnerships. So now that we've seen what the responses revealed as the biggest challenges health systems face today, let's take some time to review key takeaways centered around the health system's perceptions of payers. You know, how do they feel about payers in general? Now, the lens most systems view health plans through is that they see payers focused on the bottom line, focused over the bottom line over patient care, and they also firmly believe that their health system specialty pharmacies are superior to payer-aligned specialty pharmacies. And many respondents believe that health systems are in a battle for integrated care. And they characterize the relationships with health plans using terms like disconnected or adversarial, hostile, and conflicting interests. Health system leaders do recognize through the survey that cost is a top priority for payers, but they don't fully acknowledge the pressure put on payers by employers and patients, and are concerned, frankly, that payers sacrifice care quality for cost. And among our blinded interview participants, there were some health systems who stated they had some success with payers, but for the most part, that was very limited. And now, at this point, I'd like to ask Andy again just to, to share any observations or key takeaways he had concerning the health system point of view. Yeah, thanks, Jerry. So I think when, when you read those terms, adversarial or in competition, those are, are pretty striking terms, and I think collectively we need to take a step back and think about there's always a patient stuck in the middle of these conversations. So it kind of comes back to the earlier conversation about really making sure that you can measure value and you're providing a very customized or at least having a customized conversation with the person on the other side of the table. So I think when we take a step back and when we think about it, health systems are being viewed through a commodity lens. And the way to differentiate is to define the model based on what makes it unique. And I think the keys are to make sure that you have that holistic patient view, that you can measure the outcomes, intervene on the patient earlier, and really leverage those as key differentiators to stop being viewed through that commodity-based lens. I think that's where the opportunity lies, and I think that's where really the messaging should focus um, in order to build traction between both parties. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you, Andy. I appreciate that insight. So we've reviewed what our research revealed about challenges and perceptions of both health plans and health systems. And the responses also confirm that there is a disconnect between both stakeholders. And the disconnect seems to be exacerbated by misperceptions on both sides. So now let's take a look at that third bucket the bucket we call finding common ground. But does common ground exist? Now, the responses we heard across the board pointed to yes, and both sides also see the need for a partnership approach. Now, this quote from a health system pharmacy vice president really set the stage for me. It said, the ones that can find partnerships are the ones that are going to survive. Being siloed, you're going to lose in the long run. The long-term gain is what partnerships you can form within your universe to survive in the market. Because I think the siloed payers and the siloed integrated systems are going to become second tier. We also heard one health plan executive share this. That there's a lot of work being done on real-world evidence, how to collect it, integrate it into the approval processes, and how to manage the drugs. An integrated system has the advantage of looking at the big picture and making an integrated decision on pharmaceuticals. As we look at the survey responses from both health plans and health systems, what rose to the surface appeared to be a common twofold goal patient care and enhancing the value of specialty medications to patients. And we heard health systems and health plans want to deliver the best outcomes for patients at the optimal cost. 
going back, Andy, to your point of creating value. And ultimately, the, quote, battle we heard reference to is for the same goal, a more patient-centered, collaborative approach to developing integrated care models that benefit all stakeholders. And common ground also includes a belief on both sides that rising drug costs are unsustainable and that we do need to really understand the total cost of care and that the shift from fee-for-service to value-based care is not going away. And finally, and probably most important here, is that the partnership creation cannot be a cookie-cutter approach. Each partner has a unique need or unique needs and struggles that are opportunities to address. So, if the research reveals that despite these challenges and misperceptions, there is, in fact, common ground, what next? Where do we start? Well, we heard a few things in these surveys. We heard that health plans view specialty pharmacy as a commodity business and that they aren't necessarily familiar with the health system's offering. And also that total cost of care is paramount. And like any other potential partner, a good place to start is simply clear communication, being able to share and dialogue back and forth. And some suggestions from our survey participants indicate that health plans can start by communicating their challenges and strategic goals and begin to evaluate if and how health system specialty pharmacies can provide value. They can also begin by sharing data with health systems to measure the total cost of care impact of specialty drugs. And health systems can begin communicating the capabilities, goals, and results, and probably most important, collect meaningful metrics and results to craft a data-backed value proposition. Oh, and yes, health systems need to be willing to counter the misperception that health systems are too expensive by being open to accept competitive pricing and better yet, negotiate. So at this time, again, I'd like to ask Andy uh, to take some time and provide your perspective on finding common ground. Yeah, thanks, Jerry. So I think if we take a step back, I think we would be remiss if we didn't say that we can find common ground. And honestly, when you look at the trajectory of healthcare costs and premiums, we can't say that there's not opportunity to find benefits for all parties involved. So I think the key is we all recognize that the current trajectory is unsustainable. So we need to find a way to improve the trajectory and make sure that we improve the care for patients at the same time. So there's clearly an opportunity there, and there's clearly a benefit for us all to work together. And honestly, the marketplace is looking for us to find a solution to it. So if we take a step back and look at the regulatory landscape, I think that's where we're going to see where the rubber really meets the road here. There's recognition that the current path is not sustainable, that there needs to be some changes related to how payer networks are managed or manufacturer networks are managed and how care is being delivered. So if you take a step back and you look at the regulation, there's over 100 individual pieces of legislation at the state level that are being proposed, which would impact one of those three areas. And ultimately what happens in that model is we have a very patchwork regulatory environment that makes it very difficult for us to manage patients and very unique scenarios within a local or regional geography. But I think what we need to do is we need to focus on those partnerships before really the hand gets forced upon us and we need to make sure that we find those partnerships earlier so that we can make the changes necessary to improve care now rather than waiting until it's it's found to be unsustainable and is regulated upon us. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you, Andy. And again, a great insight. At the beginning of this presentation, I shared with you that I wanted all participants on this call, regardless of their role as a stakeholder, to be able to walk away with some practical knowledge or steps that one could take to further this discussion in your respective markets. And we thought that by utilizing a case study or a real world example of a health plan and a health system specialty pharmacy partnering to create value to patients and employers, we could illustrate some steps and milestones that have proven to be successful. With this case study, we illustrate 
three research-backed strategies that health system pharmacy leaders must apply to build payer partnerships. And at a high level, what we'll see play out in this case study is a two-hospital system in a competitive metropolitan market that elevated specialty pharmacy as a strategic priority in 2017. And after an extensive search, they decided to partner uh, with Trellis Rx in the fall of 2018 to grow their existing specialty pharmacy service. They gained access to the largest local commercial payer in the fall of 2019. Now, to get to that final point, gaining access to the largest commercial payer in their market, this health system had to employ three critical strategies. One, they had to take a system-wide approach to specialty pharmacy services. And they had to demonstrate value with data. And finally, they had to develop a deliberate, intentional plan for engaging payers and ask themselves, what are the success factors, going back to Andy's point? So I know there are a number of health systems represented on this call today. And as we move through this section of the presentation where we talk about collaboration, I'd like you to ask yourself the question, am I doing this today? Do I have a system-wide approach? And can I demonstrate value with data? And do I have a plan to engage payers? Now, to set the stage for successful payer partnerships, health systems must take a strategic system-wide approach to specialty pharmacy. So what do we mean by this? Specialty pharmacy can't be a hobby. You know, it can't be something your pharmacy team members do in their spare time. It requires a dedicated team whose primary focus is specialty. You know, when they get up in the morning, they come into work, their focus should be totally on growing the pharmacy and providing the best model and patient care possible in the specialty space. And to deliver real clinical results and deliver value for payers, it can't simply be another pharmacy initiative. Antibiotic stewardship, formulary management, and PMP leadership are nice and even essential, but the results-driven specialty pharmacy program must involve leadership at the executive or the C-suite level. And in this case study, we'll see a health system that took this system-wide approach. And simply put, executive and pharmacy leaders elevated specialty pharmacy as a priority for the entire enterprise and further committed to expand the clinically integrated care model that Andy talked about at the beginning across the specialty areas to reach its full potential. And to deliver that differentiated value to patients and other stakeholders, the specialty pharmacy needed to be clinically integrated. The clinically integrated model that Andy described embeds pharmacists and pharmacy liaisons directly into the care teams to provide high-touch personalized support. Access to patients, providers, and the EHR enable clinically integrated health system specialty pharmacies really to achieve superior outcomes compared to off-site or call center approaches. And, and this embedded model, which we find in a number of bona fide health system specialty pharmacies that are out there, it's critical to, provide, critical to provide a, a coordinated patient experience, ensure appropriate effective use of therapies, enhance clinical outcomes, and boost provider, and create provider satisfaction and create value for payers. So the second strategy employed business health system that led to a successful partnership was to demonstrate their unique value as an embedded health system specialty pharmacy with data. And I believe just about every stakeholder on this call can probably agree, whether you're a manufacturer, payer, or consultant, that consistent standardized clinical benchmarking data for health system specialty pharmacy is simply lacking. In this case study, the system-wide approach we discussed in the previous slide allowed for investment in infrastructure to put the pharmacy in position to excel on operational and experiential metrics, and then quickly began differentiating on clinical and qualitative metrics. Now, this system developed a specialty pharmacy scorecard that was focused on four types of metrics. Of the operational and experiential metrics, frankly, they're table stakes. And what do I mean by that? These are capabilities you'll see in the gray boxes. These are minimum requirements that any health system specialty pharmacy must perform. And they must perform at this level to engage a health plan. 
These metrics include things like our KPIs, such as medication turnaround time, abandonment rate, adherence, customer satisfaction from both patients and providers, and they need to, as I said, excel in these metrics. Now, the clinical and the qualitative metrics we see in the green boxes are what set the medically integrated health system specialty pharmacy apart. Having that embedded pharmacist with access to key clinical data, such as labs, records of ED visits and admissions, as well as disease-specific measurements like rapid 3 and rheumatology, as well as the 25-foot walk time and depression screenings and multiple sclerosis, these are key. And finally, this health system in the case study employed a single common technology platform that combined opportunity management, referral management, and clinical management into one system. And this allowed the pharmacy to respond to payer reporting needs quickly and to augment new clinical protocols almost immediately. You may recall what we heard from our survey respondents is this cannot be a one-size-fits-all approach. Each market is different, and each health plan is faced with unique circumstances and pressure from their employer clients. And in this case study, the linchpin for pulling it all together was the health system's deliberate plan for engaging payers. Now, with specialty pharmacy capabilities, infrastructure, and outcomes in place, they identified and strategically approached payer targets. <clears throat> now, this step-by-step -step approach or the process to help systems manage care team was key. They had the relationships, and they knew more of what was important to each payer in their local market. The pharmacy team and managed care team together began by building understanding and focusing on shared goals. And they incorporated this into a larger conversation and negotiations. As you know, the managed care team relationship with the payer may involve multiple contracts. They may have provider contracts, infusion contracts, or home health contracts in addition to pharmacy. And it was also critical that the managed care team have a strong understanding of specialty pharmacy contracting processes and requirements. So in a sense, pharmacy needed to educate the managed care team on the pharmacy benefit, as this, to a lot of them, it was new. They also needed the ability to act quickly, and it was important to have a fast response to data requests and a rapid analysis of fee schedules, where the IT and the informatics platform was key. And the specialty pharmacy team needed to create and submit detailed outcomes-focused reporting. And finally, as a group, the health system needed to be willing to negotiate on pricing. And this is where the key to understand in detail the overall economics of the contract is important. This includes not only specialty, but any other contracts in play. Now, as you can see, this approach led to a successful contract and a partnership within the first 12 months of the launch of their specialty pharmacy. The rapid scaling of capabilities while working collaboratively with them, collaboratively with the managed care team uh, to employ the strategic approach simply worked. So in conclusion, oh, the Trellis research uncovered misperceptions that inhibit health plans and health systems from collaborating on specialty pharmacy today, but also found that many leaders from both stakeholder groups believe partnership is critical to improving patient care and the value of specialty pharmacy in the future. And at Trellis, we believe that health system pharmacy leaders are well positioned to be agents of this change. Now, I know firsthand this is possible. I was fortunate enough to help build these partnerships for an academic medical center in my former role, and now I lead these, now I lead these efforts for Trellis partners. And to get here, though, we must be willing to dialogue with our counterparts at health plans and be able to get our organization to commit to these strategies. And with that, I'd like to ask Andy to share his final thoughts before we move to the Q&A portion. Yeah, thanks, Jerry. And I think you do summarize it very well. I think there's significant opportunity, but I think the key is the investment and managing it truly as a business rather than a hobby is key. The biggest challenge that I ran into when I worked within the health system space or when I've helped other systems create their programs is all about the scale and scalability. So making sure that you're planning for the future 
making sure that you have your operations steady, but making sure that you're resourced appropriately so you don't introduce gaps and that you're not resource constrained when new products launch or when you get new payer contracts is critical to making sure that you have long-term viability for your program. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you, Andy. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that insight again. And uh, before we get into the q and I'd like to thank you uh, for the honor and so that you're being able to present this research and the data. Both Andy and I are grateful for your participation. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to the McKenzie and team to just uh, kind of walk us through the, the Q&A portion of this presentation. Wonderful. Well, Jerry and Andy, thank you both so much as well for such a great presentation. Like Jerry said, we'll now begin today's question and answer session. Please submit any questions you have by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your dashboard. And we will try to get through as many questions as we have time for. So it looks like we already have a lot of great questions rolling in. The first is from an audience member who's asking, can you share more details on what types of payers participated in the market research? Sure, uh, I'll take that, Andy. And, and really it was uh, had a number of payers participate, as you know. Uh, it, most of them ranged from the uh, local or regional payers, I would say. Uh, there were some national participants. And the mix between the regional and national participants it consisted of there was commercial plans and they had ACOs as well as um, some managed Medicare and Medicaid. So it was really a nice blend of the potential um, payer participants out there. Perfect. Thanks for weighing in on that. The next question is, is accreditation required to gain access to payer specialty pharmacy networks? I can take that one also, and feel free to chime in, Andy. Um, I would say specialty pharmacy, um, it is required in some senses that payers typically require that uh, in the long term. Uh, however, the relationship is key. They may be amenable, and we've seen this uh, play out, to accepting being in process. Right? If there's a commitment or if there's if a, if a health system specialty pharmacy may not have year act accreditation or ACHC accreditation yet, but they may allow them to participate to participate and contract initially with the letter of intent or the goal of, of seeking accreditation. But eventually, uh, that it may be within the first year, nine months, that accreditation for the most part has to take place. There may be a few plans that don't require it, but if there are, they're becoming fewer and further between. Andy, any comments on that? Yeah, thanks, Jerry. So the one thing that I would add to that is it's not just a matter of are you required to be accredited, but are you required to be accredited by a particular body? And if so, is it one accreditation or is it multiple? So what happened several years ago was there was there was one primary accreditor that was called out within most manufacturer contracts and also within the payer contract space. We've seen the accreditors really start to diversify. So they're starting to offer areas of specialization beyond traditional specialty pharmacy. So I think accreditation is and will continue to evolve. I think as a result of that, it will continue to drive more payer focus on it because it will demonstrate a differentiated level of service within very specific therapeutic areas. So I think it's not just, is it required? It will be a, a very specific evaluation by the site on how many accreditations, which accreditations are required, and ultimately you need to make the determination of, is the juice worth the squeeze? Because accreditation not only is an onerous task, but it's expensive. And then also the uptake and upkeep of accreditation and making sure meeting continuous improvement standards is a pretty significant undertaking. Great, thank you both for weighing in on that question. I think that helps clear it up for our audience. The next question is, what are the most important metrics a health system specialty pharmacy can show to payers? Thanks, and I'll jump in on this one first, Jerry, and you can, you can follow up with additional thoughts. I think the key is when you look at metrics within the marketplace, the traditional metrics which are being managed by payers are things that have been readily measurable by the traditional specialty pharmacy marketplace. So it's things like time to fill, it's things like compliance metrics, even though the methodology is different, call center metrics. It's operational performance measures, but not necessarily outcomes-based measures. 
So for me, when I talk to payers and when I talk to manufacturers and when I talk to service providers, there's very much a focus on outcomes, but the outcomes are much more challenging to truly identify, measure, and report out. So I think the traditional metrics are critical, and you'll continue to be required to perform and report on them. But I think when you think about the most important metrics for future growth, it's really outcomes measures. So what is graft life within your transplant program? What does joint replacement look like for patients with rheumatoid arthritis who are managed on biologic disease modifying agents? How frequently are your patients moving from earlier therapies to a biologic within Crohn's or ulcerative colitis? It's more the patient management aspects which are differentiated in the market that will continue to gain value as the market matures. Jerry, I'll turn it over to you if you have additional thoughts. Completely agree with you, Andy. I think you're spot on. I have no additional comments. Perfect. Well, thanks for weighing in there, Andy. This next question is from an audience member who's asking, what are the key factors that should guide a health system in deciding to start a specialty pharmacy? Andy, I'll let you take that one if you don't mind, and then I'll, I'll comment on that. I know you've, you've been down this road as well as I have, but uh, feel free to, to chime in. Yeah, absolutely. I think the key that drives most systems into specialty pharmacy is risk-based agreements. So again, when you take a step back and when you look at risk-based agreements on the medical benefit side, or as institutions develop an integrated payer or begin their own ACO, the risk-based aspect of care really increases the requirement and increases the necessity of having an internal program. So there's a perspective within the marketplace that health systems are getting into specialty because it's, it's a revenue opportunity, and, and that is true. But the reason that systems got into specialty pharmacy in the first place was due to patient care gaps and really the most risky or cost-adverse um, patient population from an organization's risk profile. So when I look at why we created specialty, it was because we couldn't get our transplant patients to be managed appropriately through existing models, and that extended to HIV, and then it was really a cascade model from there. So for me, I think the biggest driver is risk and really understanding where do you have risk, where do you see risk coming within the next several years. The revenue will support operations, and you need to make sure you manage it appropriately and, and measure it like a business. But I think taking a step back and really looking holistically at how the organization is, is beginning to evolve typically is one of the key drivers for starting the conversation and stimulating um, the the actual deployment of specialty services. Yeah, thank you. And I, I agree with you. And I think also that uh, I think there is a fit for specialty pharmacy for nearly every institution or every health system out there. But what that looks like depends on uh, the, the volume, the number of patients, as well as the internal resources a system may have, internal expertise. Uh, sometimes it may involve building it on your own or partnering. And the first step would be uh, to go through an assessment process to see if this works for me. So, again, risk-based kind of forces us, clinical care moves us in that direction. And then, oh, yes, I want to move forward. What does that look like? So I, I agree. There's an opportunity for everybody. It just may differ from institution to institution. Wonderful. Thank you again both for weighing in there. The next question we have is about negotiating with payers. Um, this audience member is saying, in my experience, there is no negotiation. It's really just to take it or leave it pricing coming from the payer. So can you elaborate on how to engage payers on being open to talk about pricing? Sure. I'm happy to jump in here on this one, Andy. And I think uh, that's a great point. It sounds like that person and myself, we've had experience with, with payers or health plans. Uh, take it or leave it. I, I can empathize with that that feeling. Uh, I do know, though, um, payers, like we said, are businesses interested in patient care and taking care of their customers. And uh, it's it's really um, that's where we needed to leverage the managed care relationships. It is about relationships. A lot of times, these payers, as we spoke of earlier, it's not just pharmacies. These payers have infusion contracts. They have inpatient. Uh, agreements. It's the big picture. 
and if, if the health system can work with the managed care team, the managed care team can communicate with the payer and, and say, okay, we'll give a little bit here, but we want pharmacy to be part of that and negotiate and kind of work as a complete package. At the end of the day, the pharmacy is going to need to accept parity. The same pricing as just about any other specialty pharmacy out there, but uh, it may feel like it's taking or leave it, but there is room to negotiate, and, and it does work, but it, the key starts with relationships and communication. Andy, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I would agree. I think the the key challenge is when you're trying to negotiate your way into participating in contracts, it does feel very much as a take it or leave it type of approach. And I think what we need to recognize is the way that payer contracts are, are structured and the way that, that payers are deploying benefits, they've negotiated with their insured groups for fixed benefits. So for them to pay more for an existing service really changes how they amortize risk across their risk sharing pool. So it may be challenging for you to change the way that they're reimbursing for a particular product in that first negotiation. But if you demonstrate value and you demonstrate benefit, then subsequent conversations about differentiated services or things that may change the reimbursement model from the existing contract structure, you can entertain those conversations and at least have them at the table so that they understand where there are challenges or where there's there's the pinch points or the pain points um, as you service the patients. But I think that's part of going in with a realistic expectation that you likely are not going to walk into a contract negotiation be able to dictate the terms. You may need to participate at parity with their existing network for a year or two as you demonstrate the value before you can actually show differentiated service and renegotiate at that point. I think that's a great point to add. Thanks, Andy. We have a couple other questions here just about you know, proving the value of specialty pharmacy to a health plan. This audience member is asking, what key items can you do with your own employee health plan to show the value proposition of your pharmacy? Yeah, I can jump Sorry, in on this one first, Andy. Oh, go, yeah. go ahead, Andy. <laughs> All right, so I think uh, the key is, if you haven't optimized what you're doing for your own employees or for your own insurance plan, that's a great place to start. So you really need to focus on the low-hanging fruit first, and that's a great demonstration area for you to show benefit for either earlier intervention or how you manage patients and outcomes. So if you have an integrated payer who has patients that are being seen outside of the organization or who are being seen through different care models, it allows you to really measure cohorts and look at patient populations and how those patients' care is delivered differently. So you can look at things like infusion versus self-administered therapies and cost savings there. You can look at compliance metrics and patient performance. You can institute before and after based performance measures like Jerry was talking about, where you're looking at clinical measures of patient outcomes to therapy, like a 25-foot walk score, or you're looking at uh, patient performance and, and ACR type of scores. So there's there's a number of things you can measure, but that's a great proving ground for you to demonstrate value for your own payer for kind of a captive audience of patients so that you can show that value to external payers and really demonstrate what you're doing on behalf of their membership. Yeah, I agree. I mean, that's a, that's a wonderful place to start. In effect, it's a laboratory to demonstrate value to other payers outside. And one nice thing about your own health plan, if you're working with your own health plan, you do have access to the total cost of care. So if you can have access to that total cost of care and implement programs to demonstrate value, it's a perfect case study to take to outside entities. So it's just, I mean, to me, it seems like the ideal scenario um, in, in working with your own health plan. Perfect. Well, it looks like we have time for about one more quick question, which is, what type of individuals need to be employed in the health system specialty pharmacy to negotiate these types of contracts with payers and manufacturers? I'll, I'll chime in. I, I think the key to negotiation, again, it, it boils down to uh, the health systems probably already have uh, a managed care team available, and they, again, have the relationships. So employing a specific type of person uh, I think it would be a person that, that fits into the managed care uh, team that understands the big picture, understands what health plans want and need, 
And then if you're thinking about on the pharmacy side, uh, the pharmacy uh, person to engage that managed care team just simply needs to be dedicated uh, to that process uh, and understands the clinical uh, as well as operational requirements and keys and just be able to have the ability to interface back and forth with the managed care team. But I believe the managed care relationship is key. Wonderful. Well, that is all the time that we have left for today. I want to thank Jerry and Andy for such a great presentation and Trellis RX for sponsoring today's webinar. Please enjoy the rest of your day and we look forward to having you join us for future webinars.